So this is the second mechanics lecture. In this lecture we're going to be looking at more than one dimension, free fall, kinematic equations, relative velocities and uniform circular motion. So if you want to read up on what's covered in this lecture, you can look at sections 2.4 and chapter 4 in your textbook. First of all, a quick recap of the most important concepts that we saw last lecture. We saw that vectors can be written with a magnitude and direction, or they can re be represented in unit vector notation. We saw vectors can be added head to tail or component by component. We saw that displacement, which is a vector, is given by the displacement is equal to the final position minus the initial position. And distance, which is a scalar, is the total path length. We saw the average velocity is given by the total distance travelled divided by the time ta it takes to travel it. And the average speed, where speed is a scalar and velocity is a vector, is given by the total distance travelled divided by the total time. We saw that instantaneous velocity, which is the velocity that it has at an instant, is given by the limit as the change in time goes to zero of the change in the displacement divided by the change in time, which is just the derivative of the position with respect to time. We saw that in SI units, distance is measured in meters and time is measured in seconds. And we also discussed significant figures. We said that you should give your answer with the same number of significant figures as the piece of data used in the calculation with the least number of significant figures. Finally, we had a look at motion graphs. We saw that acceleration is the gradient, which means it's the derivative of the velocity versus time graph. We saw that velocity is the gradient and hence the derivative of a displacement versus time graph. That displacement is the area under the curve or integral of a velocity versus time graph. And that velocity is the area under the curve of an integral or the integral of an acceleration versus time graph. So we saw that the average velocity is equal to the total change in the velocity divided by time. And finally, we had a look at motion graphs. We saw that acceleration is the gradient or the derivative of the velocity versus time graph. We saw that velocity is the gradient or derivative of the displacement versus time graph. That displacement is the area under curve or integral of a velocity versus time graph. And that velocity is the area under the curve or integral of an acceleration versus time graph. We saw that the average acceleration is given by the change in velocity divided by the time over which that change occurs, and that the instantaneous acceleration, which is the acceleration it has at any instant, is just the derivative of the velocity at that time. So now we're going to be looking at more than one dimension. So displacement, velocity, and acceleration are all vector quantities. So to answer questions when there's more than one dimension involved, then we need to split the vectors into their components and consider each of these components separately. So to practice doing this, homework set 1 for Phys 1121, questions 7 and 8, and for 1131, questions 8, 9 and 15. Okay, but what do we mean by this? How do we actually apply this? Well, to see what we mean by this, let's have a look at an example. So I'm going to paste this example on a separate page where we can work through it now. Okay, so this is quite a hard example. We've got a rabbit runs across a parking lot on which a set of coordinate axes have strangely enough been drawn. The coordinates in meters of the rabbit's position as a function of time are given by these expressions. 
Now, in part one of this question, we're asked at t equals 15 seconds, what is the rabbit's position vector r in unit vector notation and magnitude angle notation? So st let's start with unit vector notation because that's easiest. So at t equals 15 seconds, then we've got x is equal to, we just need to substitute the 15 seconds into this. So this is equal to minus 0 0.31 times 15 squared plus 7.2 times 15 plus 28. So now we evaluate this and we get 66.25 meters. And we do the same thing for y. So this is equal to 0 0.22 times 15 squared minus 9.1 times 15 plus 30. And evaluating this, we end up with minus 57. So now to represent it in unit vector notation, we take x as the i direction and y as the j direction. So r is equal to, now everything here is to two significant figures, so let's write this to two significant figures. So this is 66i minus 57j, and that's meters. Now we also need to give it in magnitude angle notation. So magnitude angle notation, we've got 66 here and then 57 downwards. And we're trying to work out what this magnitude and angle is here. So to work this out, we can use Pythagoras. These are at right angles. So this is the square root of 66 squared plus 57 squared. So when we calculate that, we get 87 to two significant figures. Now we also need to give the angle. So let's calculate this angle here. We can write, well, tan theta is equal to opposite, which is 57 over adjacent, which is this one, which is the 66. And so solving that on the calculator, we end up with theta is equal to 41 degrees, just taking the inverse tan of this. So we've got, um, this is 87 meters at 41 degrees below the positive x axis is one way to describe that angle. Okay, part two then asks us, what is the velocity at t equals 15 seconds? Okay, so the velocity in the x direction is dx dt. And so we want to differentiate this. So we've got two times minus 0 0.31. So that's minus 0 0.62 t plus 7.2. So we'll want to work out what this is at 15 seconds. So Vx at 15 seconds, we substitute in 15. So this is minus 0 0.62 times 15 plus 7.2. And so this is equal to minus 2.1 meters per second. And then we'll want to do the same thing for Vy. So Vy is equal to dy dt. We get the general expression just by differentiating this. So that's 0 0.22 times 2 gives us 0 0.44t. And then we've got minus 9.1. So Vy at 15 seconds is equal to, we'll just put 15 in for this t. So it's 0 0.44 times 15 minus 9.1. And solving this, we end up with minus 2.5 meters per second. So we can write V as a vector minus 2.1 I that gives the X direction and then we've got minus 2.5 J and that's meters per second. And if we want it in magnitude angle then let's sketch a little diagram. We've got 2.1 going to the left and 2.5 going down. So we want to evaluate this square root of 2.1 squared plus 2.5 squared, evaluating this and we end up with 3.3. And then we also want this angle. So we've got tan theta is equal to 2.5 over 2.1, which solving on the calculator gives us theta is equal to 50 degrees. So we can say or 
3.3 meters per second at um, 50 degrees below negative x axis. Okay, and then finally, part three, we're asked what's the acceleration. So to get the acceleration in the x direction, this is dv x dt, we'll need to differentiate this and we get minus 0 0.62 and we need to evaluate that at 15 seconds. But there is no t here. So the acceleration in the x direction is always minus 0 0.62 meters per second per second. And in the y direction, we're differentiating dvy dt and that's equal to 0 0.44. And again, this is constant. There's no dependence on time. So a y is equal to 0 0.44. So in unit vector notation, we've got a is equal to minus 0 0.62 i plus 0 0.44 j. Or we can do it in magnitude angle format. So in that case, we've got minus 0 0.62 going that way. And then we've got Sorry, it didn't leave much room. 0 0.44 going up. So we want to evaluate this one. So that's the square root of 0 0.62 squared plus 0 0.44 squared. And when we evaluate that, we get 0 0.76 meters per second per second. And then we need this angle. So we've got tan theta is equal to 0 0.44 over 0 0.62, which gives us theta is equal to 35 degrees above the negative x-axis. So in that case, you can see we solved for each of the dimensions completely independently. The x and y weren't dependent upon each other. So we just had to differentiate x twice to get the acceleration and do, do the same thing to y. Okay, so now we're going to start considering free fall. So close to the surface of the Earth, objects experience a constant acceleration, which we give the symbol G, which is due to the gravity of the Earth. Or do they? Okay, so at this point we had a look at a demonstration showing what happened when we dropped two objects. We saw that this is true if we don't have other forces acting like air resistance. So when we can negate the air resistance, then this is absolutely true. And all objects fall at the same rate close to the surface of the earth. Though often in everyday applications, there is some air resistance. So it doesn't all behave this ideally. So then just a note, G actually varies a little bit around the earth. So in Sydney, G is 9.80 meters per second per second, while the average value for the Earth is 9.81 meters per second per second. So we'll look at this in more detail later when we study universal gravitation, but it's basically related to how far from the center of the um, Earth the surface is at that point. So the Earth is not, in fact, a perfect sphere, though often we model it as one. So the kinematic equations describe situations when the acceleration is constant in one direction, such as when an object's undergoing freefall. So let's derive these now. We're going to start from our expression A is equal to dv dt. We'll let u stand for the initial speed, the initial velocity. So this is v at t equals zero. We'll let s equal the displacement, so the final position minus the initial position. And we'll need to remember that a is constant. So these are the kinematic equations, and let's derive them now. OK, so this is what we want to derive. And we're going to start from a is equal to dv dt. Now, what we can do is write this as a dt is equal to dv. And now we're going to need to integrate to get rid of the dt and the dv. So we'll integrate both sides. Now t equals zero, the speed is u. That's how we defined u here, the initial speed. And then at time t, the speed is v. So let's do this integration. So when we integrate this side, we get at 
and that's from 0 to t. And this side here is v, and that goes from u to v. So this tells us we've got at is equal to v minus u. So we can write this as v is equal to u plus at, which is this first kinematic equation here. So let's call that one a. Okay, so now what we're going to want to do is try and get an expression for the displacement s. So let's write v as ds dt. So ds dt, that's the velocity, is equal to u plus at. And now what we can do is in, um, multiply through by dt. So we've got ds is equal to u plus at times dt. And then once again, we'll integrate both sides. So we're going from time is 0 up to t, and we'll go from x initial to x final. So this is when we integrate x final minus x initial, which is how we're defining our s. So that's equal to s, and then this side we're integrating, and we get ut plus, when we integrate this, we get a half a t squared and this is at 0 and this is at t. So we've got s is equal to ut plus a half a t squared. So we've now managed to get our second kinematic equation. So let's call that one b. Okay, now let's start from a to try and get this one here. So we can rewrite this one as let's square both sides. So we've got v squared is equal to u plus a t squared, which is equal to u squared plus 2 uat plus a squared t squared. Now we're trying to get it to look a bit like this. So let's write this as u squared plus, I'm going to pull 2a out of each of these as a common factor. So I can times this by a half and times it by 2, and I'll pull 2a out. So we've got 2a, and then this is ut, plus when I pull 2a out of this, I've still got this half, and I've got an a here, and I've got t squared. Now why this is useful is over here in the equation b, we showed that ut plus a half at squared was equal to s. So we can write this as u squared plus 2as. So we've now got our third kinematic equation here. So these are important equations that describes what happens when the acceleration remains constant. Now one thing that we can describe using these kinematic equations is projectile motion. So projectile motion is when we throw an object like a ball, it um, experiences the gravitational force. So with projectile motion, we can consider the horizontal and vertical components of the motion separately. So what forces act on the projectile once it has launched? Okay, well, once an projectiles launch, the only force acting on it is the gravitational force. So this is of course assuming that air resistance is negligible, which it may or may not be. But when we're solving problems at this level, we generally assume that it's negligible. So the gravitational force is the only force which is acting on that object and it's acting vertically downwards. So a question for us to try, two identical bores are launched from the same height one with no horizontal velocity and one with a horizontal velocity of one meter per second, which will hit the floor first. Well, in both these cases, the only force which is acting on the objects is the gravitational force. So the gravitational force is pulling both of them downward. So even though this ball is traveling horizontally this way, it's still feeling the same downwards force. So they'll actually hit the floor at the same time. Because their downwards acceleration is the same, and so their downwards motion is exactly the same. It's the horizontal motion which is different. So we're now going to consider the range of a projectile, which tells us how far a projectile will go. We're taught to use the kinematic equation, so let's write them down. We've got v equals u plus at. We've got s equals ut plus a half at squared. And we've got v squared equals u squared plus 2as. Those are our three kinematic equations. And we're asked to use these to derive an expression for the maximum height. So that's the first thing that we'll want to do, the maximum height. And then we'll want to do the time of flight and finally the range um, of a projectile launched with an initial speed u. 
So let's draw a little diagram of our projectile. It's launched with a speed u at an angle theta above the horizontal. Okay, so it's launched up like that. And we can assume that the ground is a horizontal plane. So what's going to happen is it's going to follow a parabolic path like this. So this is u and this is theta. And then what it will be useful to do is to consider u if we break it into a horizontal and a vertical component. So we can split it up like this. This is theta in here. Here's the horizontal component. So that's ux and that's equal to u cos theta. And then here's ui, the vertical component, and that's equal to u sine theta. So we're looking to calculate the maximum height. So on our diagram, the maximum height is here. And what do we know actually happens at maximum height? Well, at maximum height, the vertical speed vy must be equal to zero. Let's suppose vy was positive but not zero. Well, in that case, it's still traveling upwards. So if it's still traveling upwards, it can't be at maximum height yet. How about if vy was negative? Well, if it's negative, it means that it's been traveling down. So that means that we have to go back in time to when it was traveling up. So when it just switched from traveling up to traveling down is when it's at maximum height. So this, this is what we know happens at maximum height. Okay, so let's look at our kinematic equations and work out, well, which one's going to be most useful? Given that we know Vy and we know our initial speed, then which one's going to be most useful for calculating the height? Well, this has got things we know, but it doesn't give us the height. This one here, S, that will be the height but we don't know t, so that's possibly not useful yet. v squared equals u squared, we know v, we know u, and this gives us the height, and we do know the acceleration as well, it's just the acceleration due to, to gravity. So this is the most useful equation for this case. So let's write this down for the vertical case. We've got vy squared is equal to uy squared plus, well, that's not actually right, plus yet, We've got plus 2a, but a is equal to g, and it's down, so negative. So minus 2g times s. So what we're trying to do is get this height. So at maximum height, we can substitute in vy equals 0. So we've got 0 is equal to uy, which is u squared sine squared theta minus 2g. And this s, that's the displacement of maximum height. So that's the maximum height here. So we can rearrange this and write, well, the maximum height is equal to u squared sine squared theta divided by 2g. So we've derived a nice expression now for that maximum height. Now next, we're asked to calculate the time of flight. Now, like we did here, we defined what, what happens at the maximum height. Well, the, the flight ends when it reaches the ground over here. So flight ends when s is equal to zero. So if we can find when s equals zero, then we've got our time of flight. So let's look at these kinematic equations again and see which one's going to be most useful for this situation. So we know s, so we'll want to use one of these ones with s. And what we're trying to do is find t. So this one's not useful but this time because it doesn't tell us about t. So this one is going to be the useful one for calculating this next thing. So let's write this one down. We've got s equals ut plus a half a t squared. And we want a vertical displacement of zero. So we'll be doing the vertical components. So we've got zero is equal to the vertical initial velocity is u sine theta and that's times t, minus a half times g t squared. And we're trying to solve this for t. So let's pull t out as a common factor. So we've got then u sine theta minus a half g t. 
Okay, so this tells us that t equals zero is one solution, which is good because that's when it left the ground. It left the ground at t equals zero. So we'd want that to be one solution, but it's not the solution we're looking for. We're looking for the other solution, which occurs when this part of the expression is zero. So this will be zero when we've got u sine theta is equal to a half gt. So that will tell us t is equal to two u sine theta over g. So this here tells us the time of flight. So this is, of course, assuming that this is a horizontal plane. So it's landing at the same height it left from. OK, so finally, it asks us to calculate the range. So what we know now is how long it spends in the air. Now, horizontally, there are no forces acting. So horizontally, the acceleration is zero. So you can see that V equals U. The velocity is not changing. So horizontally, um, velocity does not change. So we can use this second equation again. S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared. But the acceleration horizontally is zero. So we've just got that our displacement, which is our range. This is our range. A horizontal displacement, so range is equal to ut, which is equal to u cos theta times t. And we've just calculated the time it's spent in the air here, so 2u sine theta on g. So this is equal to 2u squared cos theta sine theta over g. So that expression is absolutely fine, and we could leave it that way. But sometimes you'll see it written another way. So let me just show you how to get to how it's written the other way. To get to how it's written the other way, we'll need to use some of our trigonomic identities. So these are on your formula sheet, but we've got sine A plus sine B is equal to 2 sine A plus B on 2 times cos of A minus B on 2. Now, in the case when b equals 0, this tells us that sine a is equal to 2 sine a on 2 times cos a on 2. Now, this might look a bit familiar with this one here. If we let a on 2 equal theta, then you can see we've got 2 a on 2 a on 2. So we can use that to rewrite this as, uh, as u squared times sine a, and a is equal to 2 theta, so times sine of 2 theta on g. So this is another way of writing the range equation. Now, if you want to practice answering projectile motion questions, for Phys 1121 set 1, try questions 9 and 10. For 1131, try questions 10, 11, 12, and 16. Okay, so we're now going to consider relative velocities. So we'll be considering two reference frames. And in reference frame A, Alex is at rest. Okay, so let's draw a little diagram. Here's the floor. Here's Alex. He's standing here in reference A, very stationary. So now he sees Barbara move past with a speed VBA. Okay, so here's Barbara. I'll try and draw her looking like she's moving a bit. So she's moving this way with speed VBA, directed along the x-axis. So this here is our x-axis. So we're told that the subscript here stands for the velocity of Barbara measured by Alex. Now in Alex's reference frame, he observes a particle to have a location xpa. So let's draw a particle. Here's our particle p. Now according to Alex, this distance here is given by xpa. And we're asked, how is this related to the position of Barbara measures for p? So if Barbara is measuring where P is relative to her. She'll measure it as this distance here. So this is going to be X of P measured by Barbara. 
and the location of Barbara measured by Alex. Okay, now where does Alex measure Barbara to be? Well, here. So this distance here is equal to x of Barbara measured by Alex. So hopefully you can see from this little diagram that this tells us that xpa is equal to xba plus xpb. So next we're asked to now imagine that point P starts to move along the x-axis. So this point is now moving. The speed of P measured by Alex in frame A is given by VPA. Okay, so this is VPA that's measured by Alex, not by Barbara. And we're asked, what is the speed of P as measured by Barbara in frame B? Which is, we're trying to find VPB. Well, whenever we want to find speeds, we've got that the speed is equal to dx dt. We need to differentiate the position. So we have that dxpa dt is equal to dxba dt plus dxpb dt. So just differentiating these, we get vpa is equal to vba plus vpb. So trying to get VPB, we just rearrange it and we've got VPB is equal to VPA minus VBA. So that was the equation that we were trying to show. Now we're told here that when we solve problems, we usually take the ground as the stationary reference frame. Okay, so Alex is stationary on the ground. So we could replace Alex here with the ground. So we don't always show this subscript for the ground because it just comes up so much. So often we can write this as V of P relative to B. So this is V of point P relative to Barbara is given by the velocity of P. So this is assumed to be the velocity of P in the grounds reference frame and minus the velocity of B. And these are velocities, so it's a good idea to, to mark them as velocities with a little squiggle underneath them. So relative velocities can happen in more than one dimension. So for example, we could have people moving in different directions over a plane instead of along a straight line. So the relative velocity equation that we've derived also holds in more than one dimension. So in this case, we can solve it either adding our vectors head to tail or by breaking our vectors into components. So to practice this, try homework set one, questions five and six for 1121, or questions six and seven for 1131. Okay, so in this problem, we have a plane that moves due east. So just because it says due east, that means that's relative to the ground. So let's draw the ground's reference frame here. So this is the ground and our plane is moving east. So this here is the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. And it says, while the pilot points the plane somewhat south of east towards a steady wind that blows to the northeast. So the wind is blowing in this direction. The plane has a velocity VPW relative to the wind with an airspeed relative to the wind of 215 kilometers per hour directed at an angle theta south of east. So let's sketch this here. So here's east, here's south. And so we're going down like this. This is an angle theta. This is 215 kilometers per hour. And this is the velocity of the plane relative to the wind. Now we're also told that the wind has a velocity VWG, so this is of the wind relative to the ground, relative to the ground with a speed of 65 kilometers per hour directed 20 degrees east of north. So let's draw that on this wind reference frame as well. So ground reference frame, sorry. So it's 20 degrees east of north and it has a magnitude of 65 kilometers per hour. And this is the velocity of the wind relative to the ground. And we're asked, what is the magnitude of the velocity of the plane relative to the ground? So we want to know what's this. 
and we also need to work out what's this theta. So let's write down our relative velocity equation. If we want to work out the speed of the plane relative to the ground, then according to our equation, that is equal to the speed of the plane relative to the wind minus the speed of the ground relative to the wind. Now the problem is, really, when we think about it, the ground's not moving relative to the, to the wind, it's the wind that's moving relative to the ground. But these two things are equal and opposite. So in terms of what we've got, we can write this as the velocity of the plane relative to the wind plus the velocity of the wind relative to the ground. And now we've got a nice vector equation because we've got this vector sketched here. We've got these two vectors. So this tells us that if we add these two vectors, this is our resultant vector. So let's add those vectors. So here's the velocity of the plane relative to the wind. This is 215. And this angle here is theta. And then we're adding head to tail the velocity of the wind relative to the ground. So that goes up like this. And we know this angle here is 20 degrees. And we know that the velocity of the plane relative to the ground, which is the resultant, is easterly. So that's the resultant there. And that's the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. Now, let's start by working out theta. Because it goes easterly, we know that the northerly components of this vector and this one, which is the velocity of the wind relative to the ground, must cancel each other out. So that's this side of this triangle must be the same as this side of this triangle. So we can write this side of this triangle as the opposite, so sine of theta times 215 is equal to this side of this triangle. So it's next to this one. So this is equal to VWG, which is 65. So this is 65.0 times cos 20. So we can solve this for theta. It's the inverse sine of 65 cos 20 over 215. And when we solve that, we end up with 16.5 degrees. So now we know this is 16.5 degrees. So now we can work out what this is. Probably the easiest way to do this is just to consider this as two triangles and work out this length and this length. So we can write, well, the magnitude of VPG, which is easterly, is equal to 215 times cos of 16.5 plus 65 times sine of 20. And solving that, we end up with 228 kilometers per hour. And we know it's easterly, but we just asked for the magnitude. Okay, so one final kind of fun problem, the monkey and the hunter. So a hunter is hunting a monkey. They know that when they shoot the monkey, the noise from the gun will scare the monkey into letting go of the branch. It is grasp grasping. Where should the hunter aim in order to hit the monkey? Okay, so above the monkey, below the monkey, or at the monkey? Well, the answer is actually at the monkey because the bullet is going to drop at the same rate the monkey drops. So if initially they're aligned, then when the monkey lets go, they're both going to fall at the same rate and the bullet will end up hitting the monkey. So on to new material, uniform circular motion. So a particle undergoes uniform circular motion if it travels around a circle at a constant speed. So the question is, what remains constant during uniform circular motion? And there was a list of things on this form to choose between. We could choose speed, which does remain constant. It tells us that here in the definition. Okay, now velocity. As the particle is going around a circle like this, the velocity is not actually remaining constant because the direction of the velocity is always changing. So even though the speed remains constant, so the magnitude of the velocity remains constant, the direction's changing, so velocity is not constant. 
The acceleration, that's also a vector. So the acceleration is actually always changing direction with time as well. So that's not constant. Because the acceleration's not constant, the force on the object, which is causing that acceleration, is also not constant. It's always changing direction. And the other thing that we could choose was period. And the period does remain constant. If it's going at a constant speed and it's got a constant radius, then the time it takes to go around once around the circle always remains the same. Okay, so when we're considering uniform circular motion, the speed is given by v is equal to 2 pi r over t. So this makes sense as this is the circumference, which if something's going around a circle is the total distance it travels, divided by the period, which is the time it takes to go once around. So that's divided by the time. So that makes sense. But now let's consider the direction of the acceleration. So we'll do this more formally later, but we can um, do this fairly intuitively. So let's draw the velocity at this point as it's going around in a circle. The velocity is a tangent to the circle. And then at this point, the velocity is a tangent to the circle as well. So let's call this our initial velocity and this is our final velocity. And let's work out the acceleration between the initial velocity and the final velocity. So we know that acceleration, at least the average acceleration, is equal to v final minus v initial over t. And these are vectors and acceleration is a vector. So if we're drawing vectors for this, we've got v final is going that way. And then we're minusing v initial, which is going this way. We're dividing by t, and t is a scalar, so it has no direction. So this is equal to v final, which is this way. And when we subtract off a vector, we add on one, which is going in an opposite direction. So we add on this one. And you can see that the acceleration, well, the change in velocity is directed this way. It all, the time doesn't affect the direction, but it will affect the magnitude of this thing. Vf and Vi is going at a constant speed, so they've got the same magnitude. So if we were calculating angles for these exact two points, which are kind of 90 degrees with each other, this would be 45 degrees in here. But the important point is if we draw, draw this average acceleration between this point and this point on the circle, you can see it's pointing towards the center of the circle. So the acceleration always points towards the center of a circle when an object's undergoing circular motion. Okay, so we're going to derive some important equations that we'll need to describe uniform circular motion. So uniform circular motion means that it's moving with a constant speed. And we've also got a constant angular velocity. So let's start by considering a particle which is here at t equals zero. So we'll call this one here theta equals zero. And then in some time t, it moves up to this point here. So if we draw a line there, the angle in here, let's call that theta one. And at t one, it's at this point here. Now, because this is a circle, the length along here is r and the length along here is also r, the radius of the circle. Now the angular speed is given the symbol omega. So this is the lowercase Greek letter omega. And this is equal to the change in angle over the change in time. So if it's starting at an angle zero at time zero, this is just equal to theta over t. And to get the instantaneous angular speed, we can differentiate theta with respect to t. So for uniform circular motion, this thing is constant. So we can say, well, the total angle it's traveled through then is given by omega times t. Now, what we want to do is come up with some expressions for the speed and the acceleration. So in order to do that, let's write down how the position of our object, which is undergoing circular motion, changes with time. So we can write the displacement as 
looking at this point here, if we were to measure its x value, it would be equal to this length here, which you can see is equal to r cos theta 1. And this along the y-axis up here, we've got the length r sine theta 1, with this being angle theta 1 here. So if we had some random angle theta, then we can say, well, s, the position, is equal to r cos theta in the i direction plus r sine theta in the j direction. And we know how theta is changing with time because we've just written down this formula here. So this is equal to r cos omega t in the i direction plus r sine omega t in the j direction. And now if we want to get the velocity, the velocity is the derivative of the position. So we've got v is equal to ds dt. And so differentiating this, we can write this as r omega. And when we differentiate a cos, we end up with a negative sign. The omega came out from here times sine omega t i. Plus, when we differentiate this sign, we get an omega out the front. So r omega cos omega t j. So we can work out the speed if we want. The speed is the absolute value of the velocity. So when we do that, we've got a vector. Sorry, it's in the negative i direction. So it's going back this way. Um, r omega sine omega t. And then in the j direction, up like this, we've got r omega cos omega t. So adding those together head to tail to get the magnitude, this is the square root of r squared omega squared that occurs in both these terms times cos squared omega t plus sine squared omega t. And so this is these two things added together are 1, so this is r omega. So the speed is equal to r omega. There's another way that we could derive this as well if we wanted. Um, from circle geometry at school, you possibly remember that arc length s is equal to r theta. So the speed it's going at is how quickly its arc length is changing. So ds dt is equal to the speed. And this is also equal to d r theta dt. Now the radius isn't changing. The radius of the circle it's going around stays the same. So this is r d theta dt. And d theta dt is omega. So this is equal to r omega. So these two are in agreement for the speed of the particle going around the circle. Okay, but let's go on and get the acceleration. So to get the acceleration, we need to differentiate this. And when we do that, we've got here, we pull another omega out the front. So minus r omega squared cos omega t i plus we, again, we pull another omega out the front, and this actually becomes negative because when we, when we differentiate the cos, we get negative sign. So this is minus r omega squared sine omega t j. So this we can write, looking up here, we've got r cos omega t i. So we've got r cos omega t i there, and r sine omega t j r sine omega t j. So we can actually write this as minus omega squared times s. So this actually tells us that the acceleration is in the opposite direction to the position. So when the position's here, the position's going from the origin to the point the particle's at. So this is the direction up here of the position. The acceleration is back in the opposite direction. So it's back along here. So this formally shows us that the acceleration is towards the center of the circle. Now, if we want to evaluate the magnitude of this, we'll need 
the magnitude of the acceleration is equal to minus omega squared times the magnitude of s. Well, we don't need our negative sign there. We can make it positive for magnitudes. So to work out the magnitude of s, we've got s up here. We've got r cos omega t plus r sine omega t. And just the same as we did here, but without the omegas, you can see that's going to have a magnitude r, which makes sense because it's going around the circle. So it's always at a distance r from the center. So this is equal to omega squared r. So we can also write this using v is equal to omega r, like we derived here and up here. So we can write this as replacing omega with v on r v squared over r squared times r, which is equal to v squared over r, which is what's often used for acceleration. So the important point is the acceleration is directed towards the center and given by v squared on r. Okay, so we're now asked to predict what will happen to the speed and period of a bob as the length of the bob decreases. So we looked at this in class. So we need to make the assumption that tension is constant. Now, if we assume that the tension's constant, it means that there's a constant force applied. And as we'll see later, F is equal to MA. So if this is constant, then A is constant. And we've just shown that A is equal to V squared over R. So we're assuming that this is constant. Okay, now if this is constant, it means that the initial speed over the initial radius is equal to the final speed, well, squared, squared, over the final radius. And we're trying to work out what will happen to the speed. So we want to know, well, what's going to happen to this speed. So we can write this as initial radius over final radius is equal to initial velocity squared over final velocity squared. So this tells us that as RF decreases, Vf also decreases. So a nice thing we can do is if Rf equals a half Ri, then we can work out what the ratio of the velocities will be. So this would tell us that we had Ri over a half Ri, which is equal to 2, is equal to Vi over V f squared. So this will tell us that vi over vf is equal to root 2. Or we could say, well, vf is equal to the initial velocity over root 2. Now, we're also asked about the period. So we know that period is equal to 2 pi r on v. So this is a bit difficult because it's got an r and a v. It's dependent on both of these things. So we can say, well, t initial over t final is equal to 2 pi r initial over v initial over 2 pi r final over v final. Simplifying this, the two pi's cancel out. And we have r initial times v final over r final times v initial. Now we can replace the r initial on r final with vi squared over vf squared. So this is equal to vi squared vf over vf squared vi. These cancel and we get vi over vf. So this tells us if vf decreases, tf decreases. And if the <laughs> radius was halved, like we did up here, then we can see, well, Ti over Tf, Vi divided by Vi on root 2. So this will equal root 2. So Tf 
will equal the initial period divided by root 2. So it decreases by a factor of root 2, the same as the velocity. So we've got a video to show this here. Um, this one was analysed in Tracker to slow it down so that we could actually see what was going on. So here's the track opened in Tracker. You can get an idea of the speed of the ball from the length of the blur. Let's just pause it here and have a look at the speed. So when the string was around about 40 centimetres long, the speed is around about 6.5 metres per second. So you can see the blur is getting a bit shorter, so the ball is slowing down, the speed is getting slower. And around here, it looks like it's got around about half the radius. So at this point, the speed is equal to just over 3.5 metres per second. So before we had 6.5 metres per second, and that divided by root 2 gives us 4.6. So it's going just slightly slower than, root, than the original speed divided by root 2 which isn't surprising as it was losing some additional energy due to friction and other things. So here's an example problem. A woman rides a carnival Ferris wheel at radius 15 meters. So radius is 15 meters, completing five turns about its horizontal axis every minute. So five turns per minute. So we can use this to work out omega. Omega is equal to the angle that goes through over the time. The time is one minute, so that's 60 seconds. And it's doing five turns. So that's five times two pi radians. So this is radians per second. So this is equal to 10 pi over 60 radians per second. And we're given that the Ferris wheel turns at a constant rate, what is, first part, the period of the motion? So the period is the time it takes to complete one complete circle, and it does that five times in a minute. So the period is the seconds in a minute divided by the five turns. So that's equal to 12 seconds. Every 12 seconds, it completes one complete circle. Part two, the magnitude and direction of her centripetal acceleration at the highest point. Okay, so the acceleration is given by V squared on R, or we can also write it as omega squared R. So this is probably easier in this case because we've gone ahead and worked out omega at the start. So this is equal to, simplifying this a bit, we can get rid of the factor of 10. So we've got pi on 6 squared times the radius, which is 15, which when we solve it on the calculator, we get 4.1 meters per second per second. Now, this is asking for the magnitude and direction of her centripetal acceleration at the highest point. So at the highest point, she's going like this. So the acceleration is always directed towards the center of the circle. So in this case, it's going to be downwards. So we should include the direction here, downwards. Okay, now part three says the magnitude and direction of her centripetal acceleration at the lowest point. So that's here. So we can see when the velocity is this way, then the acceleration is going to be this way. But because she's going at a constant rate, this part's all going to be the same. The actual numbers are going to be the same. So this will be 4.1 meters per second per second upwards. Now, if you want to practice some extra centripetal motion um, questions, 
for Phys 1121, try set 1, questions 11 and 12, or for 1131, try questions 13 and 14. Okay, so a problem. A cart is propelled over an xy plane with the acceleration component. So the x component is given by 4 meters per second per second, and the y component is given by minus 2 meters per second per second. So the initial velocity has components of 8 meters per second in the x direction and 12 meters per second in the y direction. And we're asked in unit vector notation, what is the velocity of the cart when it reaches the greatest y coordinate? So we need to find the velocity, but first of all, we will need to find out when does it reach greatest y coordinate. Okay, so it'll reach the greatest y coordinate when vy equals zero, for the same reason that when we have projectile motion, the greatest height is when it's changing direction. So we need to find out when is vy equal to zero. So we have ay is equal to minus two meters per second, and we can use, well, v is equal to u plus at, and we're considering y components. Here. So we can write this as well, vy is equal to uy, which is the initial y velocity, so we were told that's 12, and then plus ay, and ay is minus 2t. So we want to know, well, when is this 0? So solving this, we can rearrange, and we've got, well, 2t is equal to 12. So that happens when t is equal to 12 divided by 2. So that happens at 6 seconds. So we now know that we want to know the velocity at 6 seconds. So we have a velocity for vy here. We'll also need to get a velocity for vx. So we can write, well, vx is equal to ux plus ax t. So solving this one, we've got Vx is equal to Ux, which was 8. And then the acceleration in the y direction is 4t. So we can write, well, V is equal to 8 plus 4.0t. And this is in the x direction, so i, plus 12 minus 2t. And this is in the y direction, so j. But we want to evaluate this now at six seconds. So this is equal to eight plus four times six i plus 12 minus two times six j. So solving this one on the calculator, we've got 32 I. This one's zero because of the requirement up here that at this time it was zero. So this is the answer to this problem. Okay, so in this problem, a certain aeroplane has a speed of 290 kilometers per hour and is diving at an angle 30 degrees before, below the horizontal. Okay, so let's sketch a little diagram. Here it is diving down like this. This is 30 degrees here and it is traveling at 290.0 kilometers per hour. The pilot releases a radar decoy. The horizontal distance between the release point and the point where the decoy strikes the ground is 700 meters. Okay, so here it is, it releases this. So the initial velocity of the decoy is the same as the velocity of the aeroplane. But if we look down at the ground here, it travels a total distance from here where it's released to of 700 meters. And we're asked A, how long is the decoy in the air? Okay, well, we know that horizontally, no acceleration, which tells us if we're using S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared, then for our x components, then this thing is zero because the acceleration is zero. So it's just traveling at a constant horizontal velocity. And we know how far it goes horizontally. It goes 700 meters. We can also work out the initial 
x component of the velocity. So if we break this initial velocity, because the decoy has the same initial velocity as the aeroplane into x and y components, then our x component is 290.0 kilometers per hour times cos of 30. So let's convert 290 kilometers per hour into meters per second. So we've got 290 kilometers per hour. So that's times a thousand meters in a kilometer to get rid of our kilometers and then times 60 times 60 seconds in one hour to get rid of these hours. So we're effectively doing 290 divided by 3.6. And when we solve that, we get 80.55 meters per second. So we can put this in here and we've got UX is equal to 80.55 times the cos of 30. And that's times t. And so this will tell us the time to get to the ground. So t is equal to 700 over 80.55 times cos 30. And solving this, we end up with 10.0 seconds. So that's part A. Now part B, it says how high was the release point? So now we're trying to get the vertical height. So we will want to use one of the kinematic equations, the vertical ones. So I think S equals UT plus a half AT squared is the best one because we know everything here so we can calculate the height. So h will be equal to uy. So it's going downwards. So that's 80. Well, the displacement is downwards. It ends up at, if, if we count the initial height as 0, then it ends up as minus h. So I'm going to leave off my negative signs for going downwards. Actually, I'll put them in. It's probably less confusing. So it ends up at a height minus h below its initial point. The initial speed is 80.55 times this is the sine of 30 times t which we've just calculated as 10 seconds and then it's going downwards here with an acceleration of 9.8 so half of that's 4.90 and then that's times t squared which is 10 squared so now you can see that all our negative signs cancel out so they've now left for the next line. And when we solve this, we get, well, h is equal to 897 meters. Okay, so another problem. Two ships, A and B, leave port at the same time. Ship A travels northwest at 24 knots. Okay, so let's draw a little diagram here. Here's ship A is traveling northwest, so like this, at 24 knots. And this is ship A. And ship B travels at 28 knots in a direction 40 degrees west of south. Okay, so ship B is traveling like this. This is 28 knots. And this is 40 degrees here towards the west. So this is west, this is east, this is north, and this is south. And we're told that one knot is one nautical mile per hour. And part A, we're asked what are the magnitude and direction of velocity of ship A relative to ship B. So we want the velocity of A relative to B. Now let's answer this by breaking it into components rather than by using the magnitude vector part. Okay, so if we want to break the velocity of A into components, then in the east-west, we've got 24, this is 45 degrees, because this was exactly northwest. So this is equal to 24 cos 45. And this one here is 24 sine 45. And then we'll break this one into components as well. So again, going west, in, in the westerly direction, we've got 28. Now, if this is 40, this angle in here is 50. So this is cos 50. And this one here is going to be 28 sine 50. 
So we'll call east west the i direction and we'll call north south the j direction. Okay, so writing this down, we've got the velocity of a relative to b is equal to the velocity of a minus the velocity of b. Okay, so this is equal to minus 24 cos 45 i, the negative because it's going towards the west. And then in the j direction, we've got plus 24 sine 45, and that's j. And then we've got minus the velocity of b, which is equal to minus 28 cos 50, and that's i. And then we've got minus 28 sine 50, and that's j. So we'll want to put our i and our j's together. So we've got minus 24 cos 45 plus 28 cos 50. So the plus is because we had negative negative, and that's i. And then we've got plus 24 sine 45 and then we've got negative, negative, so again, plus 28 sine 50, and this is J. So solving this on the calculator, we get 1.03i plus 38.4J knots. Okay, now in part A, we needed to find the magnitude of this. So we've got 1.03, and then we've got 38.4. So we want to find the magnitude of this thing. So to find the magnitude of this, we add these two together using Pythagoras' theorem. So it's 1.03 squared plus 38.4 squared. And so this gives us a magnitude of 38 knots. And then we also need to find the direction. So we want to find out what this angle in here is. This angle here will then be north theta east. So if we can work out that angle, that angle is the same as this angle, just using alternate angles on parallel lines. So we can use, well, tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, so that's 1.03 over 30, sorry, 38.4. And so solving that, theta is equal to 1.5 degrees. So part B, the answer is north 1.5 degrees east. Now part C says, after what time will the ships be 160 nautical miles apart? So we're told that one knot is equal to one nautical mile per hour. And we have calculated the speed here. So we can just use, well, the time is equal to the distance divided by the speed. This is just because the speed is equal to the magnitude of the velocity, which is equal to the change in x, i.e. the distance it goes, divided by the time. So this is equal to 160, because we're trying to get our 160 nautical miles, and the speed that they're traveling apart at, if we keep our significant figures, so here we've just written it down to two significant figures, but when we actually calculated it on the calculator, it was closer to 38.4, so let's, let's keep that. And so when we solve this, we get 4.17. This is nautical miles, and this is in nautical miles per hour. So this answer is in hours. So this is equal to 4.2 hours to two significant figures. Part D then says, what will be the bearing of B, the direction of B's position, relative to A at this time? Okay, so... When we were calculating this first part, we were kind of assuming that B was stationary and A was moving, and this gave us the direction that A would travel in that case. 
Now, we're now considering, well, what happens if we are A and we're measuring B? So this is actually a, makes an angle of 180 degrees with this one. It's, it's like the opposite. So the answer to this one is south 1.5 degrees west, i.e. in the absolutely opposite direction. This is a fairly challenging problem. So we're told at t1, which is two seconds, the acceleration of a particle is in counterclockwise circular motion is 6.00i plus 4.00j meters per second per second. So let's just sketch what this is going to look like. At t1, the acceleration is going to be 6.00i and then we've got plus 4.00j. So we can work out the magnitude of the acceleration using Pythagoras' theorem. So this is 6 squared plus 4 squared, which is equal to the square root of 52. Let's just leave it that way at the moment. So if we consider here's our circle, we can see the accelerations up in this direction. We know that the acceleration is always going towards the center of the circle. So at T1, the particle must be somewhere like around here, and it's moving in the counterclockwise direction like this. Now, the other thing we can do is we can work out this angle here. Let's call this angle here theta 1. So we can say, well, tan theta 1 is equal to the opposite, which is 4, over the adjacent, which is 6. So solving this, we get theta 1 is equal to 33 0.7 degrees. So if we sketch this in here, theta 1 is also up here, alternate angles on parallel lines. So that angle in there is theta 1. Now we're told at T2, which is 5 seconds, the particle's acceleration is given by this expression. So we've now got 4i and then it's minus 6j, so it's going down like that. And so the resultant acceleration is down like this. Now, these numbers have the same magnitude, so the magnitude of the acceleration is still the square root of 52. Let's call this angle in here theta 2, and we can see that tan theta 2 is also equal to 4 over 6. So theta 2 is also equal to 33.7. Now, the acceleration goes towards the center of the circle. So the particle must be up here at T2, and the acceleration's down this way. So we've got this angle in here is theta 2. Now we're asked, what is the radius of the path taken by the particle if T2 minus T1 is less than one period? Okay, so we know that T1 is 2 seconds and T2 is 5 seconds. So it takes 3 seconds to go this far around the circle. Now, theta 1 and theta 2 are equal to each other. So hopefully you can see that if it's going from here to here, it's going through 270 degrees, three quarters of a circle in the three seconds. So in three seconds, the particle travels around three quarters of the circle. So to determine this, we needed to know that T2 minus T1 is less than one period. Now we know the magnitude of the acceleration, and we also know that the acceleration for circular motion is given by V squared over R, where V squared, well V, is equal to the total distance traveled, which is the circumference, divided by the period. So we can write this as 2 pi r on t squared times 1 on r, which is equal to 4 pi squared. Now that'll be r squared, but we're dividing by an r. So we've just got 1 r left on the top, and we've got a t squared on the bottom. Now this is helpful because we can work out the period. 
if it travels around three quarters of the circle in three seconds, it's going to travel around four quarters of the circle in four seconds. So t is equal to four seconds. So we can now rearrange this and get, well, r is equal to t squared a over four pi squared. And these are all things that we know. So we can now substitute in and we've got t squared is 4 squared times a, which is root 52, over 4 pi squared. And this is equal to 2.92 meters. And I've given that to three significant figures. So in this question, a boy rolls a stone in a horizontal circle of radius 1.5 meters and at a height 2 meters above the ground. The string breaks and the stone flies off horizontally and strikes the ground after traveling a horizontal distance of 10 meters. So the range is equal to 10 meters. What is the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration of the stone during the circular motion? Okay, so this question combines circular motion and also projectile motion. So what we'll need to do is kind of work backwards. So the stone is undergoing circular motion, then it flies off with some initial horizontal velocity only. So we know uy is equal to zero. The vertical initial velocity is zero. And it travels a horizontal distance of 10 meters. So we can use this distance to work out the initial horizontal speed if we knew how long it took to get to the ground. So to work out how long it took to get to the ground, we can use the fact that it started two meters above the ground to calculate how long it's in the air for. So if we use S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared, and considering the vertical components, then we know that SY is minus h. It starts at a height of 2 meters and it drops down to 0 meters. And this is equal to ui, which we've said is 0 because the stone flies off horizontally. So this is 0. And then the acceleration which is acting on it is just gravity. So this is minus a half times 9.8 times t squared. And h, that's minus 2. So I'm just substituting in for that there. Sorry, there's only, it's 2.0, it's not 2.00. Okay, so we can solve this to get the time. So this tells us that the time that it's in the air for is equal to 2 times 2 from this half divided by 9.8. And then we need to take the square root to get rid of this squared. So this is equal to 0 0.639 seconds. Okay, so now we know how long it's in the air for. Now we can get its initial horizontal speed. S is equal to ut plus a half at squared. And we'll put little subscripts x. But it, there's no horizontal acceleration. So this is zero. And so we can rearrange this and say, well, ux is equal to sx on t, which is equal to the range, which is 10. And now we've got 0 0.639. So this tells us that the original horizontal velocity is 15.65 meters per second. Okay, so now we know how fast it was traveling around the circle because that's this horizontal velocity. So now we can use our circular motion equation. A is equal to V squared on R where V is this velocity that we've just calculated here to calculate the magnitude of the acceleration. So this is 15.65 squared divided by the radius, which we're told up here is 1.5. And solving this, we've got 160 meters per second per second. And I've given this to two significant figures because the data in the question was given to two significant figures.